Thank you, Michael, for your kind words. And thank you to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow for this honour at uh, giving the McEwen Lecture and to the ASGBI. Um, so William McEwen was born Rossi in 1848. He attended the University of Glasgow, like myself, and was the assistant surgeon to Lord Lister in the early 1870s. He was very quickly promoted and by the age of 34 was uh, a senior surgeon and clinical lecturer within Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He was promoted through the system to become the Regis Professor of Surgery in the University of Glasgow, moving from the Glasgow Royal Infirmary to the Western Infirmary in 1892. Although perhaps out with the West of Scotland, he is not as famous as Lord Lister, his CV and achievements is probably greater. He was the first ever to drain brain abscess, resection of a brain tumour. He developed orthopaedic instruments to perform osteotomies for the then prevalent rickets and bone grafts for the fractures. He performed lung surgery for the first time and is famous for both mastoid sepsis surgery and groin hernia. As one over to the anaesthetists, he was the first to describe endotracheal intubation and was knighted in 1902. He died after his illustrious career at the age of 76 and lived in one of my own favourite places in the west of Scotland, near Garrick Head and the Isle of Butte. As testimony to his true greatness, his obituary in the BMJ ran to six pages and had a comment from all the colleges and from six countries from the then empire. His contemporaries <coughs> were at the time of the development of pancreatic surgery, which is my own particular interest. And probably the first pancreatic operation was performed by Alessandro Cordovilla in the 7th of February, 1898, where he resected the head of the pancreas and duodenum. He anastomosed the gut, but did not anastomose the pan pancreas. And this was for an epithelioma or carcinoma of the pancreas. The patient, unfortunately, died 20 days later, as will be a recurrent theme of pancreatic surgery. Halsted, a week later, was the first to perform a local excision of an impulary tumour, and he again did not anastomose the pancreas, but because this was from within the lumen of the bile, the patient survived. He was a follower of Lister's work in asepsis, and was the first to develop aseptic gloves with the Goodyear Rubber Club Company. He also had an interest in use of cocaine, and unfortunately became addicted in his later years. But the father, the true father of pancreatic surgery, was Walter Kausch. He was a graduate at Strasbourg University and in 1909 performed the first true pancreatic resection for an impulary carcinoma in a 49 year old man. This was a two stage procedure the first performing a biliary bypass, and the second, the pancreatic duodenectomy. And the patient survived. Three years later, he published his further experience in another couple of patients, two of which had surgery. As is the norm, although he performed these uh, feats 27 years previously, the acknowledged father of pancreatic surgery was actually Alan Oldfather Whipple, who in 1934 performed a two-stage resection in a six-year-old man. Again, he drained the biliary system and seven weeks later performed a limited resection. The anastomosis unfortunately dehissed and the patient died. His second patient, despite changing some of the techniques, also died, but his third survived and he has been synonymous with the name and the procedure of pancreatic duodenectomy since. The other great change was reintroduced by Bill Longmore and Bill Traverso, and that was the 
modification of the pylorus preserving pancreatic or duodenectomy, but as, as is often within the surgical literature, this procedure was actually introduced by an Englishman in 1942, and Kenneth Watson has reported in this, uh, this procedure in the British Journal of Surgery. Throughout the development, it is evident that when re reading these descriptions, the mortality and morbidity of this procedure is prohibitive. It is also a disease that affects all categories, although there's a slight predominance within the uh, lower so socioeconomic classes, this is largely due to lifestyle. It is also increasing in terms of the risk of cancer death, whereas lung, colorectal, breast and prostate are beginning to show improvements in the overall mortality, pancreatic cancer is remaining stubborn and is currently the, the, the fifth commonest cause of cancer death. It, it is associated with the, the age of the patients and with an increasing population and projected um, over the next 50 years unless we address some of the key aspects and start to get effective treatments with pancreatic cancer, it will become one of the major uh, uh, killers in pancreatic and all cancer death. When I, I chose the title, what I was looking for is standards within the NHS to compare. And these are the seven domains within NHS which are termed um, acceptable. The, the, it is important to have a safe procedure. It's got to be clinically and cost effectiveness. There needs to be a good governance system. It's patient focused, accessible and responsive. It is within a, a clean and effective care, uh, care environment and it does improve and promote and the health of local people. But what is this, there's none of this actually has any determination in terms of quality of care. Throughout the 80s, there was a series of, of, of surgeons were able to produce excellent results within small institutions or personal series. In 1995, Steve Bramhall, Simon Bramhall, produced a paper which was looking at the demographic effect of pancreatic cancer across the West Midlands. And this showed a number of absolutely key features. Probably the headline figure was the percentage mortality after resection and the difference between non-specialist and specialist units. But actually of, of probably more interest was some of the background data that emerged from this paper. Overall, there was only a 2.6% resection rate. And of those having surgery, 50 plus percent in both time periods underwent surgical expiration at the time of diagnosis. If you had a resection, you were one in four of a chance of, of dying, but because of the, the, the risk of death following laparotomy, of all patients present with pancreatic cancer, you had greater than a one in three chance of not getting out of hospital. And this was at a time when we knew from the American and uh, European centres that there was a potential for actually a close to zero uh, mortality. Within any series, it's easy to have a, a series of 118 with zero mortality or 120 with 2% mortality. But the general median um, was low single figures from the major centres, and that wasn't uh, a standard to which the UK population as a whole was able to achieve. It was also known at that time, the uh, Sloan Kettering produced a, a paper in 1995 and the famous Berkmeyer volume study in, the, um, in 2003 again concluded that there was a volume characteristic that showed an improvement in the likelihood of getting out of hospital following pancreatic duodenectomy with volume. These figures weren't ignored, and within the UK, both through the COG guideline documents and uh, the BSG guidelines in the um, uh, management of patients with pancreatic and peri tumours, 
there was a number of recommendations went forward. And these were largely to the development of networks, cancer centres and cancer units. They recognised the importance that it wasn't just the units themselves that were going to make changes, but it was about getting a consistent and agreed local and inter-hospital referral policy. There needed to be adequate palliative support and specialist care. And we needed to start to look at population levels for data sets and audit of patient management. Within the UK, we have 35 UK pancreatic cancer networks, one in Northern Ireland, three in Scotland, three in Wales, and 28 in England. Age is key within um, the prevalence, and a number of these patients are elderly and frail at the time of diagnosis. But what has made the difference? Well, certainly the formation of can cancer networks has been a major key. The lack of individualism in decision making is also important, and the multidisciplinary process of staging and management planning. But core to the improvements has been the development of clinical nurse specialists and the education and training of everyone involved in the patient's um, journey from presentation at the GP to, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, death within a palliative care facility. There was also a concentration of major resections within specialist centres as part of this process. The multidisciplinary team cannot be underestimated. And it is, whilst it is often surgeons that stand up and talk about results because these are the easiest to measure, it is actually the, uh, the softer targets in terms of the communication, the nutrition, the uh, assessment and processing of the patients, which is core to achieving better results. Education is also important. The DROP trial was published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, and this has shown that you can get a 35% reduction in the risk of complications simply by avoiding unnecessary preoperative drainage in patients with mild jaundice. Similarly, historical figures have been used to um, uh, suggest that major resection may be appropriate. On the face of it, here's a series of survival curves where the node positive and metastatic negative patients who have undergone resection as part of the SPAC trial have done significantly better than the metastatic negative advanced locally pa local patients within the GEMCAP trial. But this is actually simply down to patient selection. And looking at, at studies which have attempted to do R2 resections or palliative uh, bypass procedures has shown a clear um, benefit for bypass over resection. So palliative resections are not justified. When we do operate, it is important that we have a clear multimodality staging preoperatively. We need to be looking at the fitness assessment in that it is not necessarily only those patients who have a low a early stage disease which are appropriate. Nutritional optimization is regularly ignored. There are clear ESPIN guidelines regarding um, uh, adequate preoperative management. A standardized resection, appropriate selection, and most importantly, within an experienced team, um, and not just the experienced surgeon is key. There are now fairly clear guidelines as to um, variations within the procedure itself. There is no difference to whether doing a standard Whipple versus pylorus preserving. There is a trend towards slightly less leak rate, but no outcome differences regarding a pancreatic jejunostomy or pancreatic gastrostomy. There is a slightly reduced fistula rate with octreate reotide, and less gastric emptying difficulties following an antigrade versus a retrograde um, uh, retrocolic duodeno jejunostomy following Whipple. Within your standard resection, however, is there have an advantage to taking additional organs, as may occasionally be the case. There's been a number of studies that have looked at this, and provided that it is to achieve R0 resection, on-block resection may be reasonable. 
And the clearest example of this is a clonic, obstructi uh, a clonic obstruction secondary to a pancreatic tail carcinoma, which may benefit both symptomatically um, and, and uh, from an oncological point of view. What about vein resection? This again is not new, but has been recently revisited. Joseph Fortner pop tried to popularize this in the 70s, but with fairly prohibitive morbidity and mortality. Is the rationality? Well, certainly, this is some work that was done through our own unit, which is looking at the prognostic factors following resection. And R1 status is the most significant of the pathological factors in histological specimens. It's technically achievable, and there's a number of studies that suggest that undoubtedly it can be performed with little additional blood loss and acceptable mortality. But importantly, there is nothing to suggest that it demonstrates improved um, R0 resection rate or survival if applied liberally. Histological involvement in the vein is also associated with poor prognosis. And so vein resection is more uh, a function of the site of the tumour where the only reason why an R0 resection cannot be achieved is because of its juxtaposition to the vein. Similarly, with extended lymphadenectomy, there was popularization of this from Japan, but there's been a number of randomized studies and a meta-analysis which shows no benefit from extending the lymphadenectomy. Laparoscopic resections are also popular, and both right and left-sided resections have been achieved. The morbidity of a Whipple, however, is not generally the size of the um, uh, abdominal wound. And the adoption of this has largely been due to uh, uh, in left-sided resections of the pancreatic tail, either through a standard laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy or a, a radical antegrade modular pancreatic spinectomy taking Girotta's fashion. And whilst they are feasible, there is certainly a debate as to whether it is reasonable but there is probably a place for it in left-sided resections. I can't come to Liverpool without paying a testament to John Naptolemus and his, his group in uh, Liverpool who have driven the uh, studies and the significant sized cohort studies with 1,500 plus patients in surgical trials looking at adjuvant therapy. And we now know that adjuvant uh, chemotherapy increases actual five-year survival, um, and a single-agent gem is probably better uh, uh, or just as good as combinations. There's also good evidence that chemotherapy for locally advanced pancreatic cancer improves quality of life and overall survival. So how does this translate into actual practice? I think one of the challenges is not looking at within individual units or groups, it is looking at populations as a whole. And one of the advantages we have in Scotland is the establishment of the Scottish HPB audit network and the audit that has come from this looking at a population of just over 5 million. Some of the case ascertainment that we have achieved has um, uh, been compromised by the um, ISD not providing the registry figures for some of the smaller health boards, but due to the prominence of both WASCAN and SCAN numbers, the ascertainment is in excess of 85%. Of the patients presenting, more than half of them are pancreatic, 16% gallbladder, liver tumours are 28, and duodenum, the remainder. Interesting, if we look at age gender distributions, there's a significant difference between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, where because of comorbidity, we do not have the uh, increasing 80-plus-year-old uh, population within our cohort. We have achieved multidisciplinary meeting uh, uh, discussion and multimodal uh, decision-making pathways in over 90% of these patients. And after staging, we are looking at curative intent in only 12% of patients. But a further 60%, we are interested in looking at palliative active therapy by way of chemotherapy, and these patients are referred. A key figure is actually looking at population uh, death rate by operation. 
And this is looking at the elective rate following pancreatic resections in Whipples in Scotland as a whole. And as a whole in 2009-10, there was a 3% mortality. And that compares to the over 20% from the, the Bramall study uh, 20 years ago. So in conclusion, in a population-based audit with 85% per uh, uh, ascertainment, we've achieved a nationwide mortality of less than 3%. There's a progressive increase in survival in palliative patients. We know that chemotherapy is associated with prolongation of survival, and we have an integrated care pathway that is now being uh, spread throughout the UK. The success of this has not come alone, and one of the challenges has been that the cancer networks have been mimicked by an unplanned and unresourced benign network that has followed with them, resulting in coexistent pressures of the complex benign patients. There's a gradual extension of the, of the general surgeon who is prepared to take on the benign patient. And there's a, re, there's a patient and relative expectation that everyone with pancreatic cancer can be managed within a tertiary centre. And these are, not, these are not sustainable. We heard earlier of, that these changes have been within an environment where there's been a gradual increase and significant increase in the last 12 years in the resource available to the NHS. But we also have heard that the projection over the next five to six years is of static growth and actually probably a reduction in the uh, resource available to the provision of services. We already have noticed that we're losing a network and audit support. The CNS provided care has begun to reduce Communication with the CNSs and other AHPs is beginning to contract. And there's been also a significant change in the surgical trainee support with the working hours, etc. So is this a time where we should be taking a step back, be happy with what we've achieved so far, having uh, aligned the UK with international and national standards? We... I was saying there's a progressive improvement in survival. However, if you have a patient nowadays with pancreatic cancer and they're looking at a figure where four out of five of them will be dead in a year, that is not acceptable. If we actually look at the care provided and the cancer treatments received, we heard earlier um, about the importance that treatments need to be safe but also effective. Only 12% of our patients underwent resection. Only 17 had chemotherapy. And over half the patients, despite being referred, 70% of them being referred with curative intent or palliative intent for treatment, had no active treatment. The ongoing clinical problems is that pancreatic cancer has the worst survival of any GI cancer. We have an unacceptably low resection rate. We have an unacceptably low um, oncological treatment completion rate. There's still some regional variation with protocol compliance, particularly with adjuvant therapy, and there's significant delays in investigation pathways. If we look at the core standards, yes, it is safe. Yes, it is patient-focused. Yes, it is access accessible. It is an acceptable level of care, but for who? It is not for the patient. Acceptable is mediocre, and we need to try and move our acceptable standards forward. The audit processes we use tend to measure interventional endpoints where operation rates and mortality, because they're easy to measure, and they're often of interest to the surgeons who are running the audits. What we need to be doing is looking at wider key performance indicators, which are surrogate or indirect measures of care. Looking at perhaps those patients not only getting through surgery, but also completing adjuvant therapy, as that is now standard of care. And hospital volume may well be a measure of quality of care, as opposed to simply looking at the risk of survival. The problem with key performance indicators is they should be evidence-based, but there is currently no evidence. We have major challenges in the future trying to um, get an evidence base. Most of the assessments within 
uh, the surgical training and career progression are now looking at trying to um, identify the uh, trainee who is in dif difficulty as opposed to the trainee who is actually exceed excelling. The very important changes and necessary changes that have been brought in through good clinical practice have largely made it impossible for individual individuals to provide unresourced and uh, unsupported clinical research. And we're all very aware of the major pressures within the NHS to achieve char target. There is also a side issue, which is that the abolition of recognition within the health service for people who are involved with academic service is pushing people perhaps more into the private sector. And I think we have to address the, the, the uh, issues of recognition, both of time and also remuneration for people who are interested in clinical research. Where are we going from here? The days of the, of the large cohort study are probably over. We don't have the resources for it. We don't have the, the ability to run these studies. And the differences uh, that we are likely to pick up from um, large surgical or clinical studies are reducing. We need to change the way we're looking at surgical research look at, and trying to address the overall clinical journey. The diagnosis and rapid assessment, looking at the holistic patient val values, nutritional and physical optimization, at the same time as having stratified neoadjuvant therapy based on, on preoperative diagnosis before resection may well be the way forward, leading us to be able to address the significance of any of that uh, neoadjuvant therapy by histological marker re, uh, correlation, and then feedback into translational reassessment and, and, and a change to your uh, neoadjuvant strategy. This is a quote from Hogarth Pringle, who was a student of Sir William McEwan and from his obituary. Uh, Sir William McEwan concerned himself with facts and principles. He taught us there's no finish in the path of surgical progress. And I, for one, think we should follow in McEwan's footsteps. Thank you very much.